Well, you picked a good week to come to church because we are starting a new series today. And uh, it is a series that has the potential to get me in trouble, as many of them do. But this one in particular is a little bit different, a little bit uh, controversial because we're talking about the end times. And this is one of those things, we, we survey people on Easter, we have the last two years, we didn't do it this year, but we surveyed people and said, hey, what would you like to hear teaching on? What's something that you're interested in? And inevitably, the concept of revelation or the end times is one of the top three things that people want to know about. And so I'm going to do my best to give you some beneficial teaching from God's Word in regards to the end times and the time in which we live. I do want to lay some groundworks for this series, though. I want, to, I want to lay some ground rules, I'm sorry, for this series. The first of which is this, that I'm not going to blow your mind with information that you've never heard or seen before because there's a... Here's the problem with people blowing your mind with information you never heard or seen before. That means it has to be extra biblical. In order for you to have never seen it before, you either haven't read the Bible or I'm telling you something that ain't in there. So I, I want to I stick closely to the Word on this topic, on this subject, because the Word has a lot to say about it. The Word talks about the end times. I'm going to tell you some of the stats in just a minute about how prevalent it is. So that's the, something I need you to know is that I'm not going to blow your mind with new information. The second thing is this is not an astrology class. All right, we're not going to be studying the, the stars. And, the, and I'm not saying that God doesn't speak through those things. He has all throughout history. But that's not the, the sole thing that we look at. Because here's, what, here's why people get mad at Christians sometimes. Can I just talk to you for just a second before we get into the content? People look at Christians and we're telling them, don't read your horoscope. But then we're like, also, the world's going to end because of an eclipse. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. God speaks through the sky. But... We're not basing what we believe on that. We're basing it on this, on what this says. Now, there are some things that this says will happen in the sky. And so we look at the sky to see those things. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I just don't want you to think that we're just about to talk about the blood moons and the eclipse and the, the stars and the moon turning red and all this, because that's not what this all is. That's missing the point of the end times, by the way, if that's all you talk about. Today, we're talking about the point. And so the other thing I need you to know, the other ground rule, is this is not going to be a series wherein... About week three, I tell you, and on such and such date, at such and such time, the rapture of the church is going to take place. We're not going to do that. Because as sure as I do that, that guarantees it will not happen at that date and that time. Because no man knows the day or the hour. By the way, I used to play, I used to like try to get God on that technicality when I was a kid. Because I didn't, I didn't want the rapture to happen yet. Because I wanted to like live my life and drive and be a teenager. And so I'd be like, Lord, the rapture is going to happen today. And I thought I was tricking God because no man do the day or the hour. That was free. You didn't have to pay for that today. That was a free story. So, all right. Now, the last thing I need you to know, I know you're like, can we just get to the content already? Last thing I need you to know is I grew up in a church, I've told you this, where we preached on three subject matter every single week. We preached on getting saved, getting filled with the Holy Ghost, or the rapture. That being the case, we had a pastor of the church that I was born in and his name was, I think his name was Vernon McClellan. I can't remember, his first name escapes me, but his brother McClellan. And he would, he pastored and he preached for months on the book of Revelation and Daniel chapter 7. I mean months on those two messages, those two passages and the entire stage. We had a stage wider than our stage and it was all, the whole back of it was full of a chart. And it just, it was a timeline of here's going to happen and this is what this week was. And, and, and I'm, we're not, I'm not going to do that. I'm just telling you I'm not doing charts. I'm not crafty enough, all right? I can't, I can't make arts and crafts for you in that regard. So the main idea we need to know as we enter into this series is this, that I'm not preaching to you about the last days from an ethereal standpoint. I'm not even preaching it to you as something that we're looking at in the future. I believe we are living in the last of the last days. I believe we are in the season where at any moment, where at any moment Christ could return. There's an urgency. There's an urgency about this. And so I want to look in God's word today. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 24 in just a moment and read several verses to kind of set the foundation for what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. But before we read that, I just want to say a word of prayer. And we're going to enter into what God has for us today. Would you bow your heads with me? God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your people. I pray, God, that you would help me to preach your word exactly as you would have me to preach it. I pray that you would help me to 
hide myself behind the cross, that I could just let your word speak prevalently and speak to us today, God. It's in your glory that we, that we ask you would manifest in this place. Reach someone with the gospel of Jesus because of this sermon today. I thank you for it, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I need to warn you, I'm going to preach fast today. And that is for your benefit. Because when it's all said and done, I got 55 slides, 52 of which of them are scripture verses today. So we're going to read our Bibles this morning. I don't know why you came to church, but the good news is you're getting your Bible reading done at church today. I'm saving you some time when you get home. And so how many of y'all brought an actual paper Bible to church? Anybody? I'm old school. I like a paper Bible. This right here, this is genuine leather. It smells like leather. Like, I'm I'm old school about some stuff. I like that. I tell you that to say, if you have a a paper Bible, bring it with you to church. Mark it up. Write in it. Say, this is what the pastor said. This is God speaks to me. Because I like to write in my Bible so I can look back and see what God was saying to me. Again, that's free as well. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives... The disciples came to him privately. In other words, they've been in this public ministry. The disciples come to him and say, hey, Jesus, just like between me and you, like it's just us talking. There's nobody, there's nobody's Instagram stories being filmed right now. Like TMZ is nowhere to be found. Just me and you, Lord. How are we going to know? Why am I reading this verse to you? Because I think it's important that a lot of times we can look at the world we live in, the society we live in, the church culture we live, and we see everybody that is absolutely into, like, the end of time. And, and if you're on social media or whatever, on YouTube, everybody is making videos, they're making posts, they're writing articles, they're doing this, they're doing that to try to say, oh, this is it, this is why, this is, we're into that. And that's not new to us. The very first Jesus people, The disciples, before there was a church, there were people asking the question, how are we going to know the world's going to end? Before there was an establishment of the council at Jerusalem, there was a group of guys sitting around the fire with Jesus saying, hey, how are we going to know? So this is not a new question. This is something that has been happening from the time that Jesus walked the earth. They said, so tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Their question was this, how can we know when everything is wrapping up? And Jesus' answer is as follows. I'm going to read through these markers really quick that Jesus gives us, and then I just want to talk about them quickly as we get into the content today. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 5, we're going to read through verse number 8. He says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. They will lead many astray. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. And look at this. He says, When you hear that stuff, see that you are not alarmed. Like, Don't get scared when you start seeing what I say is going to happen, happening. Because he says the reason you shouldn't be alarmed is this must take place. This has to happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Look quickly at these markers that Jesus gives us, and we're going to continue reading on this chapter in just a moment. He says there will be wars and rumors of wars. I don't got to spend a lot of time really diving into that right now because if you've watched the news, if you've not been living under a rock, there are wars and there are rumors of wars. Let me tell you the difference between those two things and why we are absolutely living in that time. There are wars. Iran launched an attack last night on Israel. That's war. That's an actual war. War is happening in the Middle East. Rumors of wars are this. The United States is an ally of Israel at this point, and so therefore we will defend Israel, prospectively, we will defend Israel against an attack of Iran. When we do that, and we defend against Iran taking defensive actions that are seen as offensive actions on an Iranian military, Iran is in an alliance with Russia and China. And so because of that alliance, there's the potential of another world war. Aren't you glad that you came to church today from an encouraging message from the pastor? What I'm saying is there's the actual war, right? There's the war of of Iran and Israel, Israel and Palestine, Russia and Ukraine. But then there's also all of the potential corresponding wars based on the reactions to the actual wars. I'm saying this is not something that we're looking into the future. It's happening right now. We see it unfolding day to day. Earthquakes and famines. Earthquakes in various places, the scripture says. Do you know? 
that we are now more aware of earthquakes than we've ever been in the history of the world, not because they've happened at a higher frequency, but because the technological advancement of our studying tools, we can see seismic activity in ways that we never could before. And so we are more aware of earthquakes than any other point in history. The word various that it uses here, it doesn't necessarily mean an increase in the quantity. It says there are so many, they're so numerous in so many places. It's an increase of awareness of their happening. So it's not that earthquakes are happening more, it's that we know about them more because we're able to see. We're living in a play out of that prophecy. He says famines. Do you understand that right now we are living worldwide in a food shortage? In 2023, 21 million more people died of starvation than did in 2022, and it's looking like that will continue in 2024. There are a lot of other factors that play into that, but one of the biggest ones is during COVID when all the supply chains were shut down, there was a massive interruption of the world's food supply, not to mention natural disasters, pestilences, which also are in the scripture that have taken place across the world. There is a harvest and crop shortage like we haven't seen in a really, really, really long time to such a degree that famine is a worry, not just around the world, but there are even analysts that would say, hey, we're not too far from having some struggles with our food supply in the United States of America. I don't say that to scare you. This is not a doomsday message. I'm not telling everybody to go out and build a prep shelter. What I am telling you is that if you look at what is happening in the world, it is playing out the narrative of scripture time after time after time. There is case after case. Let's continue reading in verse number nine. Then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Again, so glad you came to church. We got encouraging words for you today. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, he says one of the biggest markers is there's going to be tribulation. You and I as Americans, we're like, well, we're not there yet. Let somebody in Palestine read this verse. Let, let somebody in one of the, one of the heavily uh, ruled and, and dictatorial nations that are against Christianity read this verse. They don't read it as something that could happen. Can I help you with something? When somebody comments something mean on your Facebook post of a scripture, that's not tribulation, friend. I'm sorry to tell you, like you've not been persecuted for your faith. When the person unfriends you because you took a stance on a biblical thing instead of a political thing, that's not tribulation. That's not persecution. That's just division. Like that's, that's, not, that's not anything that we see. And so sometimes it's hard for us to read these passages from our American context. But tribulation is happening all over the world. Persecution is happening all over the world. The studies say that every two hours a Christian is killed for their faith somewhere in the world. Every single day, 13 Christians die for their faith and profession of faith in Jesus Christ. So tribulation is happening, and I believe it will increase, by the way. I believe that it not being in America is only for a short period of time. Again, not to be a doomsday person. It's just you watch. Our society is literally telegraphing everything they're going to be doing for the next 20 years. Like they're telling us exactly what's coming. And we're just trying, we're turning a blind eye to it. But that's not what I'm preaching on today. It said that you will be hated of all nations, of all people. Christians are going to be hated. Do you know that the Christian faith is the most hated faith in the entire world? Pew Research did a study and they found that it wasn't even close with other religions. I have a theory about this because lies don't have to get mad at other lies. A lie didn't have to eliminate another lie in order to exist, but it does have to eliminate the truth. And so every false doctrine, every errant theology has to eliminate the foundational truth of Christianity and the word of God before it can stand on its own as a justifiable and a dependable truth. And so we're seeing this happen, that Christians are hated. And then it says many will be offended. Now that doesn't apply today. I know that that's not something we see very often. We don't see people getting offended right now. It's just everybody is just so thick skinned and social media is just a harmonious place that you can hang out and have good discussions. So there are so many people that are offended offended today. And then he says, many false prophets. Again, we are seeing false prophets at an unprecedented rate because it has never been easier to have a platform for your false prophecy. It has never been easier. You, can, you, you ain't even got to get asked to preach nowhere. All you got to do is take out your phone and record a video about a dream you had last night. And all of a sudden, Soviets are walking the streets of the United States. The Soviet Union doesn't even exist anymore, but the prophetic dream is, I mean, we, I'm sorry, that was probably too specific about a video that I saw, and I, 
Sometimes my filter turns off. So we're seeing all these prophetic things, all these people that are prophets. We're still waiting on overthrows of the government that were prophesied year, I mean, years ago. And, and just it's coming, it's coming. False prophet. Now, I'm going to tell you, in the Old Testament, they didn't play. The Old Testament, you say, I got a prophecy, and then it don't happen. You're about to get stoned, and I don't mean with drugs. I mean, like, you're about to get killed with some drugs. Not drugs, stones. I need to move on from this point because I'm, I'm getting myself in trouble. False prophets are very prevalent. And then he says this. This one is interesting to me, and I don't know, especially from an American context of a time that it makes any more sense, is he says that lawlessness will abound. You realize how, like, the narrative of lawlessness has increased so much in the last, I'm not talking 10 years, I'm talking four years. The narrative of lawlessness, anti-authority. I mean, we hate anything that has authority. We don't like the police. We don't like the president. We don't like the government. We don't like masculine men leading their homes because we need independent women that are going to be. I'm going to tell you something. Men, we got a lot of men in this room today. It is time for some men to stop bowing and cowering down. Stick your chest out and be a man. Lead your family. Tell them what's right. Tell them what's wrong. Like, men, we got to discipline our kids too. We, we got too many men that are trying to be buddy with, with, with all their little babies and then mama can do all the discipline. It's time that men lead their families. It's time that men lead their wives. It's time that men do what's right. And ladies, if you're looking for a man that's going to do all those things, then be a woman that will submit to a man like that. Because if you want to know... I ain't even preaching on none of this today. If you want to know how to end your marriage before it starts, be an independent woman looking for a leader and a man. It will not work. A house divided against itself will not stand. It will absolutely crumble. And the enemy would love nothing more than to take your little independent spirit and put it with a strong leader and let your independent spirit create insecurity in the strong leader to where they don't lead and you don't lead either because you're outside of the authority that God has for you. That's free. All right. Lawlessness. We've looked, we can look back on historical figures. And right now, this is one of the crazy things about the lawlessness of our society is it's not enough to just attack the current authority structure. We're going back and rewriting history. George Orwell wrote a book called 1984. It was a futuristic look at what he thought 1984 would look like. And in this book, there's a line that I think is so good and so true and so telling of the agenda that I believe our society is carrying, those that are pulling strings in our society. He says this. He says, those that control the past control the future, and those that control the present control the past. In other words, you weren't there when it happened, and so you're going to believe what I tell you about what happened. You're going to believe what I say. And so now we're looking at what established authority in the beginning, and we're starting to question the legitimacy of those who established the authority. Doesn't seem like a big deal. Seems like we're, we're really smart people for doing that and evaluating and studying. The problem is if you remove the structure and the foundation upon which your society is built, your society cannot stand. And so we're removing authority, erasing history, trying to start over and thinking it's going to be fine that we can somehow stand on the shoulders of the foundation that we removed. It doesn't work that way. When you remove the foundation, everything has to crumble. There's a commitment to lawlessness in our generation. And so I I read all of those things to let you know exactly what it is that Jesus said to be looking for. So what should our response be? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 13. He who endures to the end shall be saved. He says all this crazy stuff's about to happen. But if you can make it to the end, you're going to be saved. And look at what he says. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The two things Jesus says should be the response of his church is, number one, a commitment to endurance. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to bow. And the second thing is a commitment to evangelism. Promise yourself you're not going to quit and promise yourself you're going to tell everybody you can about the goodness of God. 
You're going to tell everybody you can about the faithfulness of Jesus. So that's the foundation today. I had a long intro for a short message today. Because I grew up in a world where, again, we talked about the rapture. We talked about the tribulation. I mean, I was always, I knew about three and a half years that were okay, three and a half that were bad. I didn't know if I was pre, pre, post, mid. I just knew that I was hoping it was pre, that's trip, when the rapture is going to happen, pre-tribulation, because I don't want to be here for the tribulation. If you want to be here for the tribulation, you go right ahead. You have fun. But I don't want to be here for that. I'm hoping it's before that. I don't know what to tell you. Again, we're not getting into a lot of that because I'm not smart enough to tell you definitively one way or the other. I can see all three of them in Scripture. But whenever it is, I tell people I just want to take the first flight out. Whenever that is, just sign me up that's when I want my ticket to be so if it's before in the middle or after but I grew up and you know there were some really strong theological works that informed a lot of our eschatology when I was a kid you guys might remember these put this picture on the screen you guys remember this was what informed a lot of our eschatology you guys remember these books Y'all, I mean, like, a lot of people hate on these books. I don't think they're theologically accurate, but my Lord, they're entertaining. If you've not read them or you've not listened, there's a, there's a dramatized audio version on YouTube. I love to listen to it on road trips because I'm a nerd and I'm a Christian and I only, that's, I, our entertainment choices are not all that vast, okay? So I love these, these, these concepts, but the thing is, they were not really all that strong in their biblical foundation. Like there were like little elements that were there. But I want you to notice something about all of the, the imagery. Like it's all got this hint of like scary. You know, it's like, oh, I mean, look, look at that. I mean, look at those horses. That's red and black, scary. We got fiery, the remnant. We got, I mean, it's, it's, it's scary. But we didn't just read the books when I was a kid. We couldn't watch scary movies. We weren't allowed to watch scary movies because, you know, we love Jesus. And so we, we didn't watch scary movies. But there were some scary movies that I was allowed to watch. That's what this next picture is. Apocalypse, Revelation, and Tribulation. I don't know if y'all ever saw these movies. This one's about the rapture. This one's about the Mark of the Beast, which, by the way, what they used to implement the Mark of the Beast looks a lot like Apple Vision Pros. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. This one's about the mark of the beast, and this one is about the mark of the beast, but scarier with Gary Busey and Howie Mandel. And so it's, these movies are cinematic gold. If you, they're actually terrible, but if you want to watch something that's clean and about the tribulation, I made all my kids sit down. There's a fourth one that I didn't have room for on the screen. That's why it's not there. But I made all my kids sit down and watch all four of these movies, not because I thought they were going to add a lot to their lives. I made them watch them because I said, if I had to be scared of the rapture at eight, so do you. Like, if I had to lay in my bed and worry that Jesus had come and I was left behind, you also are going to deal with that fear. So we watched all those movies. Again, the entire narrative around the rapture is scary. The entire formatting and, and framing of the story and framing of, of the events that lead up to it and what happens afterwards is like, we need to be scared. And today I want to adjust that perspective a little bit. Because if we're afraid of it, then when we see what's happening in the book of Matthew that Jesus said, then, then all of a sudden we tense up. And that's not what scripture tells us to do. I want to tell you today, the first message of this series, what time is it? The first message I want to preach to you is it's time to be hopeful. It's not time to be scared. It's not time to be worried. It's time to be hopeful. Can I throw in the caveat, if you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus today, Disregard the last 10 things I just said. Because if you don't know Jesus, you absolutely need to be terrified outside of your mind about what is happening in our world. The good news about that is you can go from being scared to being at peace with one simple surrender to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's that simple. And we're going to have that opportunity today. It's time to be hopeful. John chapter 14, verse number 1. This is Jesus talking about as things are starting to wrap up and talking about eschatology and the end of times, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms, many mansions is what the King James says. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I love Jesus. He said, look, if I go do that, you best believe I'm coming back. 
Now, he said this thousands of years ago. And in fact, Acts chapter 1 tells us about the moment that he said this the last time, or that he has a conversation with the disciples the last time, Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. This is after he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, uttermost parts of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, you know that scripture. Verse number 9, he says, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, I need you to be there. Somehow I need you to see in your mind this movie of these disciples, these 500 individuals that have followed Jesus, standing on the hillside by the Mount of Olives, as Jesus begins to ascend, just to levitate into the air. Like, this is crazy. They're looking at him, and he keeps going up. You ever watch a balloon go into the sky? Jesus keeps going up, keeps going up, and they're watching, and they're watching, and they're watching, and then you can't see it anymore? Well, that moment happens, and all 500 of them are still doing this. Until these two angelic beings, Scripture says two men dressed in white apparel, we believe they're angelic beings, they show up to them, and he said this, While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, "Um, Guys, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? In other words, what are we looking at? Like, he ain't there. He's gone. He went away. But with that same question was this. The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Can I tell you this today? Jesus told them, if I go away, I'm coming back. All 500 of those individuals died. They didn't see him again. The Apostle Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, but, but he didn't see him. He didn't come back. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians about this instance of Jesus coming back. He lived. He died. He didn't see it. Generations came. Generations went. Empires came. Empires went. Nations rose. Nations fell. They had the same promise, the same belief. If he went away, he's coming back, and he still hadn't come back. But I stand up here in 2024, and I tell you, just as real as his promise on that day of the Mount of Olives, that if I go away, I'm coming back, just as real as it was then. Today, it is still true. Jesus is coming back. He is returning for his church. He's returning for his bride. He's returning to build a new heaven and a new earth, to bring about a new Jerusalem. He's bringing all that to pass. It's still a reality, and we're watching it unfold before our very eyes. It's time to be hopeful. Now, again, I want to change your perspective in the next two minutes and 42 seconds about the rapture. I'm going to go a little over today, but I promise I'm not going to go too far over. March the 5th, 2010, me and my wife at our wedding, and obviously it was a, it was a beautiful day, and I actually, I, I went back and got some OG stuff I'm going to show you today. I had to do some work to get this, this imagery I'm about to show, throw up on this screen for you in a minute. I had, to do, I had to send a whole text message to my dad. By the way, my dad has pictures that we don't know why they're there like he it's like every person he's ever met somehow there's a picture of them on his computer it's amazing and so anytime I need an obscure picture I always text my dad and I'm like hey do you have a picture of that and he he came through in the clutch on this one so this was March the 4th 2010 the day before our wedding this was me and Kayla at our rehearsal dinner. As you can see, she has always been a gangster on ladders, hanging lights. It's not something new that happened. It's just something she's always done. We were children. I was 19. She was 18. I didn't have no beard. I had more hair. I was a little fluffier then. Like I, I'm, I'm getting there, though. I'm trying to work my way back up to that level of fluff. But we, we, we're, we were children that got married. And one of the reasons we got married so early was because we dated from 450 miles apart. And so it was very common for us to get together and say, hey, I'll see you next month. Or I'll see you in three months. That's why these kids now that are all like, it's just so hard. I'm like, bro, we didn't have no FaceTime. We were on Motorola Razors trying to text each other. Like, we... Get out of here with how hard it is to be in a relationship right now. But we were so used to having to be distant from one another. And on that night, 
as we were setting up the final things for the wedding, that we had a, a gymnasium next to the sanctuary where uh, the reception was going to be. And so she was in there working the night before, and I had my bachelor party. We were crazy, y'all. We went and played basketball and ate like Applebee's. I mean, it was crazy. So partying it up. So I went, and I told her, I said, hey, I'm about to leave. And this time was different. Because every other time, it was like, I'll see you in a month, I'll see you in a week, I'll see you in a year. This time, I knew I was telling her goodbye. And the next time I saw her, we didn't have to say goodbye like that no more. Because you see, after that time, she was going home with me. Because we still believe in doing it the biblical way, by the way. We go home after we're married. I'm, that ain't what I'm preaching today either. But... So I was excited. I didn't want to leave, but there was an excitement that when I leave tonight, when I come back and I get her, we ain't got to be apart no more. You see, when Jesus left and he ascended and he said, if I go away, I'm coming back. This is a very, very simple and very uh, not doesn't do it justice, but a picture of what was in his mind. He's going to leave, but next time he comes back, he ain't coming back to get, listen, here's the thing. We, he ain't coming back to get his friends. He ain't coming back to get his workers. He ain't coming back to get his servants. He's coming back to get his bride. We look at the return of Christ and we view it through the lens of a horror story. But today I need you to know it ain't a horror story. It's a love story. This is the culmination of a, a groom that gave himself for his bride that says, you know what? I've watched you. I've been talking to you from afar. I've been distant from you. I've watched you struggle. I've watched you be tormented and persecuted, but I'm about to step on the eastern sky, let a trumpet resound, and then the dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. He's calling his bride home. It's time for the church to understand that Jesus is coming, and that's not scary. It's exciting. Can I help you with something? This is, again, free content that was not in the first service. Is I ain't never seen a bride before her wedding day, if they really love their husband, everything they do is intentional. I can't eat that today. I got to fit in that wedding dress on Friday, so I can't be get that cheesecake out of here. I can't, I can't go there. And for sure, when the day is there, when it's finally time, and they've done all the work and the preparation, and they put that dress on, every step they take has the purity of the dress in mind. That's some good preaching I'm giving you right there. When they go to get a drink or lunch or they go to do their makeup, or they, it's, it's all, I got to be careful because this dress that I'm wearing for my groom is perfect. And I don't want to tarnish it. What if we as the church walked with such an awareness of the return of the bridegroom that we understood that we have been given the garment of purity? And we took every step, every word, every action, every entertainment, everything we did, we did with the mindset of, I don't want to tarnish the purity that's been put on me because I'm ready for my groom to come. That's what it means to walk with an awareness of the return of Christ. And we miss that in the church because here's the crazy thing. For generations... They wrote, again, Paul mentions, it's over 300 times. Let me find these stats for you real quick. I'm, I'm going to close before I get anywhere near done with all this today. But in the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the end of the age or the return of Christ. There are 216 of the 260 chapters in the New Testament talk about the return of Christ or the end times. 23 out of the 27 New Testament books have something to say about eschatology, and yet we never talk about it in the church. It is of such vital importance that every writer alludes to it. Every writer talks about it. 
And as the church, I think it's crazy that all of these men, Hebrews says that these all died in faith, not having received the promise. Like they were hoping for the day that Jesus would return. But some of them had their heads cut off. Some of them were sawn in two. This is all in your Bible in the book of Hebrews. Some of them were pierced with a sword. Some of them were burned. Some of them were killed in gruesome and grotesque ways. And Scripture says, in fact, the world wasn't even worthy of them, but they died in faith, not having received the promise, meaning they were hoping for a day. And the day they were hoping for is the generation that you and I are living in. Because I, I, I say this, I understand people have been saying Jesus is coming for the last 2,000 years. But I do not have the least bit of hesitation in standing before you and saying the return of Christ is imminent. It is coming. And it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be 20 years from now. It could be 100 years from now. But I want to live ready. I want to walk ready and be hopeful because he is coming for his bride. The sad thing is that as many hoped for this day, this generation, this time, and they died not having seen it, you and I are going to experience it, and we don't care. There has never been a more apathetic view towards the things of God in the house of God than there is in the United States of America in 2024. We have relegated this truth to an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday mornings and we check a box. By the way, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the hour and 15 model because our services, we have 9 and 10.30. That means our services are usually an hour and 15. I'm not criticizing that. I'm criticizing the believers that that's all they get. Yikes, y'all thought I was about to go through. We like it when pastors throw off on pastors. But the reason why I'm comfortable doing an hour and 15 minute service is because I've been in churches where they had it for three hours and it didn't make no difference. What made the difference between those that were in and those were out was not the three-hour services. It was the two-hour prayer meetings every morning. What made the difference was not the three-hour services. It was the ten chapters they read as a day in the old church. It was the fact that they dove in the Word. They dove in prayer. They they fasted every single week. They, they They did what they could to draw close to God. And I'm not saying that we're condemning us and, oh, we're so bad. I'm just telling you, we've got to wake up. Script, the, the whole reason this church is named Awaken is because Romans chapter 13, verse number 11, where Paul says that, and seeing the time, that it is high time to awake out of sleep. Church, Jesus is coming. And when Jesus comes, it's not going to matter what political candidate is in, is, is in office. It's not going to matter what legislation is being passed. The only thing that's going to matter at the moment that trumpet sounds is am I right with him? And today what I have prayed for and what I am hoping for is a holy awe, a holy reverence to fall over every person in this room. To where those that are far from God can know I can be brought near, but I got to make things right. And my ultimate, uh, another prayer is that those that have, have had the appearance of being close, but have not been surrendered, that we would wake up to this is not, this is not a game. This is not a hobby. This is eternity. And we're not here to have fun and make friends though we love to have fun and we love to make friends we're here because the end of all time is quickly approaching and you and I have one task two tasks that I read in scripture endure to the end and preach the gospel to every nation to every kingdom one of those is something we decide to do within ourselves the other one is we decide to do outside of ourselves so today I want you to stand with me